Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy, Haji Murad, Chapter 11. On the fifth day of Haji Murad's stay in Tiflis Loris Melikov, the Visoy's aide-de-camp, came to see him at the latter's command. My head and my hands are glad to serve the Sadar, said Haji Murad with his usual diplomatic expression, bowing his head and putting his hands to his chest. Command me, said he, looking amiably into Loris Melikov's face. Loris Melikov sat down in an armchair placed by the table and Haji Murad sank onto a low divan opposite and, resting his hands on his knees, bowed his head and listened attentively to what the other said to him. Loris Melikov, who spoke Tatar fluently, told him that though the prince knew about his past life, he yet wanted to hear the whole story from himself. Tell it me, and I will write it down and translate it into Russian and the prince will send it to the emperor. Haji Murad remained silent for a while, he never interrupted anyone but always waited to see whether his interlocutor had not something more to say, then he raised his head, shook back his cap, and smiled the peculiar childlike smile that had captivated Maria Vasilevna. I can do that, said he, evidently flattered by the thought that his story would be read by the emperor. Thou must tell me, in Tata nobody is addressed as, you, everything, deliberately from the beginning, said Loris Melikov drawing a notebook from his pocket. I can do that, only there is much, very much, to tell. Many events have happened, said Haji Murad. If thou canst not do it all in one day thou wilt finish it another time, said Loris Melikov. Shall I begin at the beginning? Yes, at the very beginning. Where thou wast born and where thou didst live. Haji Murad's head sank and he sat in that position for a long time. Then he took a stick that lay beside the divan, drew a little knife with an ivory gold inlaid handle, sharp as a razor, from under his dagger, and started whittling the stick with it and speaking at the same time. Right, born in Selmis, a small owl, the size of an ass's head, as we in the mountains say, he began. Not far from it, about two cannon shots, lies Kunzak where the Khans lived. Our family was closely connected with them. My mother, when my eldest brother Osman was born, nursed the eldest Khan, Abu Nutsal Khan. Then she nursed the second son of the Khan, Umar Khan, and reared him, but Akhmet my second brother died, and when I was born and the Kansha bore Bulik Khan, my mother would not go as wet nurse again. My father ordered her to, but she would not. She said, I should again kill my own son, and I will not go. Then my father, who was passionate, struck her with a dagger and would have killed her had they not rescued her from him. So she did not give me up, and later on she composed a song, but I need not tell that. Yes, you must tell everything. It is necessary, said Loris Melikov. Haji Murad grew thoughtful. He remembered how his mother had laid him to sleep beside her under a fur coat on the roof of the Saklia, and he had asked her to show him the place in her side where the scar of her wound was still visible. He repeated the song, which he remembered, My white bosom was pierced by the blade of bright steel, but I laid my bright son, my dear boy, close upon it till his body was bathed in the stream of my blood and the wound healed without aid of herbs or of grass. As I feared not death, so my boy will ne'er fear it. My mother is now in Shamal's hands, he added, and she must be rescued. He remembered the fountain below the hill, when holding on to his mother's sarovery, loose Turkish trousers, he had gone with her for water. He remembered how she had shaved his head for the first time, and how the reflection of his round bluish head in the shining brass vessel that hung on the wall had astonished him. He remembered a lean dog that had licked his face. He remembered the strange smell of the lipschki, a kind of flat cake his mother had given him, a smell of smoke and of sour milk. He remembered how his mother had carried him in a basket on her back to visit his grandfather at the farmstead. 
he remembered his wrinkled grandfather with his gray hairs, and how he had hammered silver with his sinewy hands. Well, so my mother did not go as nurse, he said with a jerk of his head, and the Kansha took another nurse but still remained fond of my mother, and my mother used to take us children to the Kansha's palace, and we played with her children and she was fond of us. There were three young Khans, Abu Nutsal Khan my brother Osman's foster brother, Umar Khan my own sworn brother, and Bulik Khan the youngest, whom Shamal threw over the precipice. But that happened later. I was about 16 when Murids began to visit the owls. They beat the stones with wooden scimitars and cried, Musulmans, Gazavat. The Chechens all went over to Muridism and the Avars began to go over too. I was then living in the palace like a brother of the Khans. I could do as I liked, and I became rich. I had horses and weapons and money. I lived for pleasure and had no care, and went on like that till the time when Qazi Mullah, the Imam, was killed and Hamzid succeeded him. Hamzid sent envoys to the Khans to say that if they did not join the Ghazavat he would destroy Kunzak. This needed consideration. The Khans feared the Russians, but were also afraid to join in the holy war. The old Kansha sent me with her second son, Umar Khan, to Tiflis to ask the Russian commander-in-chief for help against Hamzid. The commander-in-chief at Tiflis was Baron Rosen. He did not receive either me or Umar Khan. He sent word that he would help us, but did nothing. Only his officers came riding to us and played cards with Umar Khan. They made him drunk with wine and took him to bad places, and he lost all he had to them at cards. His body was as strong as a bull's and he was as brave as a lion, but his soul was weak as water. He would have gambled away his last horses and weapons if I had not made him come away. After visiting Tiflis my ideas changed and I advised the old Kansha and the Khans to join the Gazavat. What made you change your mind? asked Loris Melikov. Were you not pleased with the Russians? Haji Murad paused. No, I was not pleased, he answered decidedly, closing his eyes. And there was also another reason why I wished to join the Gazavat. What was that? Why, near Selmus the Khan and I encountered three Murids, two of whom escaped but the third one I shot with my pistol. He was still alive when I approached to take his weapons. He looked up at me, and said, Thou has killed me, I am happy, but thou art a Muslim, young and strong. Join the Gazavat. God wills it. And did you join it? I did not, but it made me think, said Haji Murad, and he went on with his tale. When Hamzid approached Kunzak we sent our elders to him to say that we would agree to join the Gazavat if the Imam would send a learned man to explain it to us. Hamzid had our elders' moustaches shaved off, their nostrils pierced, and cakes hung to their noses, and in that condition he sent them back to us. The elders brought word that Hamzid was ready to send a sheikh to teach us the Gazavat, but only if the Kansha sent him her youngest son as a hostage. She took him at his word and sent her youngest son, Balik Khan. Hamzid received him well and sent to invite the two elder brothers also. He sent word that he wished to serve the Khans as his father had served their father. The Kansha was a weak, stupid, and conceited woman, as all women are when they are not under control. She was afraid to send away both sons and sent only Umar Khan. I went with him. We were met by Murids about a mile before we arrived and they sang and shot and caracoled around us, and when we drew near, Hamzid came out of his tent and went up to Umar Khan's stirrup and received him as a Khan. He said, I have not done any harm to thy family and do not wish to do any. Only do not kill me and do not prevent my bringing the people over to the Gazavat, and I will serve you with my whole army as my father served your father. Let me live in your house and I will help you with my advice, and you shall do as you like. Umar Khan was slow of speech. 
He did not know how to reply and remained silent. Then I said that if this was so, let Hamzid come to Kunzak and the Kansha and the Khans would receive him with honor. But I was not allowed to finish, and here I first encountered Shamil, who was beside the Imam. He said to me, Thou has not been asked. It was the Khan. I was silent, and Hamzid led Umar Khan into his tent. Afterwards Hamzid called me and ordered me to go to Kunzak with his envoys. I went. The envoys began persuading the Kansha to send her eldest son also to Hamzid. I saw there was treachery and told her not to send him, but a woman has as much sense in her head as an egg has hair. She ordered her son to go. Abu Nutsal Khan did not wish to. Then she said, I see thou are afraid. Like a bee she knew where to sting him most painfully. Abu Nutsal Khan flushed and did not speak to her any more, but ordered his horse to be saddled. I went with him. Hamzid met us with even greater honor than he had shown Umar Khan. He himself rode out two rifle shot lengths down the hill to meet us. A large party of horsemen with their banners followed him, and they too sang, shot, and caracoled. When we reached the camp, Hamzid led the Khan into his tent and I remained with the horses. I was some way down the hiss when I heard shots fired in Hamzid's tent. I ran there and saw Umar Khan lying prone in a pool of blood, and Abu Nutsal was fighting the Murids. One of his cheeks had been hacked off and hung down. He supported it with one hand and with the other stabbed with his dagger at all who came near him. I saw him strike down Hamzid's brother and aim a blow at another man, but then the Murids fired at him and he fell. Haji Murad stopped and his sunburnt face flushed a dark red and his eyes became bloodshot. I was seized with fear and ran away. Really, I thought thou never wast afraid, said Loris Melikov. Never after that. Since then I have always remembered that shame, and when I recalled it I feared nothing.